Okay, everybody. Uh, okay, everybody. Welcome to my uh, live webinar, my presentation. Um, sinus and nasal floor augmentation and implant dentistry, a review and discussion of techniques. Uh, this presentation is the opening presentation for the first oral and maxillofacial surgery online conference, which is taking place mainly um, which is through the dentistry online group, uh, through the social media, Facebook. My name is uh, Ala Yassin. I'm a periodontist graduate uh, from the uh, University of Washington in Seattle. And I'm an uh, oral maxillofacial surgeon trained in Damascus Hospital. And I uh, hope you're going to enjoy uh, this uh, 60 or uh, up to uh, 70 minutes of uh, condensed um, information. Uh, and I'm glad to share uh, the knowledge with all the uh, audience. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, this uh, as I mentioned before, lecture is part of the uh, first oral maxillofacial uh, online meeting, which is um, really a good uh, event. We have uh, almost around uh, eight, uh, nine uh, speakers talking about from eight different countries. Proud of all of you guys talking about different uh, topics in oral and maxillofacial surgery. Uh, uh, I would uh, like to dedicate this lecture uh, actually to, uh, like to uh, my Syrian dentist back in uh, Syria, uh, who, and despite of the ongoing uh, war, they just finished the, the, uh, war, the third scientific the meeting for the dental implant uh, and cosmetic dentistry in Damascus, so with all the respect for them. Uh, my objectives for this lecture is um, straightforward, to understand the treatment options for posterior maxillary atrophy cases, and to understand the treatment options for anterior maxillary atrophy in fully edentulous cases, to comprehend the literature available for these cases, and to learn the surgical techniques available for implant placement in uh, the uh, maxillary atrophy cases, and for fresh graduate uh, dental surgeons, uh, it would be a good uh, opportunity to build a solid evidence-based skills. And for my colleagues who are experienced in dental, uh, experienced dental surgeons, it would be a refresh for their knowledge and to motivate a scientific discussion itself. Uh, the very beginning of this uh, uh, presentation, I would like to uh, claim that there is no conflict of interest in this presentation, no financial benefit by any sponsorship means, and all the cases were treated by uh, myself unless mentioned otherwise. So the presentation uh, outline would be two parts. So the first part I'm going to talk about the posterior maxillary atrophy with the sinus floor augmentation. I will go over some review of the literature, surgical techniques, lateral window, uh, or uh, so-called external sinus floor elevation, and the osteotome internal crystal uh, sinus floor elevation. Uh, the second part would be the anterior maxillary or um, atrophy, uh, the nasal floor elevation itself. We'll go uh, and review the literature, surgical techniques, and we'll discuss a case with nasal floor elevation. So, uh, starting with the posterior maxillary atrophy and the sinus floor augmentation. Let's talk about the very beginning of the maxillary sinus augmentation. It started with Boine in 1965. Mainly the uh, first purpose of this augmentation before even the, imp the dental implant treatment, uh, the, uh, the main thing was to uh, make a, uh, with the cases that have some uh, dentures or uh, restorative prosthetic reasons, they don't have enough occlusal space. So the uh, main thing was to uh, open a better space with uh, uh, lifting the floor of the sinus with the bone uh, graft and then uh, try to give him better uh, intramaxillary arch uh, space. So it's straightforward um, 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 indication at that time. A uh, very good uh, uh, review for the uh, sinus grafting with uh, Jensen happened in 1999 with a very good book. Uh, described the indications for the sinus elevation. And of course, it, it had been 
changed like uh, over the time, but we can go over the indications for the sinus elevation. For so implant placement in areas with insufficient bone, volume, and decreased uh, intra intra-arch space, oral anterior fistula repair, algal cleft reconstruction, report one bone fracturing, cancer reconstruction, and cranial fourth facial prosthesis, uh, no history of pathosis and a significant history of sinus disease, uh, no anatomic limitations. The contraindications for the sinus elevation would be, uh, um, according to Jensen, radiation treatment to the maxillary region, species, severe medical fragility, uncontrolled systematic uh, systemic uh, disease and uh, uh, psychophobias, maxillary sinus infections, and, and described. The first one is a lateral window technique described by Boyne and James, um, 1980. And the other one, as you see here and down, it is a crystal approach, uh, which was first described by uh, Tatum, 1986, and the osteotome technique with the um, Famous uh, publications through the summers would be a beginning, uh, the beginning of the 90s. So uh, down the road, a lot of classification happened to mainly give us a guide, uh, guidance for uh, the sinus uh, augmentation simultaneously with the implant placement. Uh, so, um, I like this classification, come from Michigan with uh, Dr. Lang and Katranji. Uh, they made sure to uh, explain why do we have the sinus pneumatization, and they made uh, the classification, they call it the ABC classification, to describe the uh, um, uh, the, the topic of why the uh, sinus pneumatization is happening. So they mainly they focused on either we have the sinus pneumatized after the extraction of the teeth or we have some ridge resorption. And then they uh, combine things to say we have uh, more than uh, five, less than five millimeter of uh, residual bone at the floor of the sinus or we have somewhere between six and nine millimeter and they pay attention to uh, actually the distance between the adjacent CEJ uh, of the adjacent teeth and the level of the ridge of the um, uh, atrophied posterior maxilla. Uh, so, in um, summary for their classification, uh, so they were in, uh, able to give us some guidelines about ABC, which means like either A, implant placement immediate ones when we have uh, sufficient bone left on the floor of the sinus, or if we have less bone, uh, we have the uh, option of doing an osteotome crystal approach for implant placement with the sinus augmentation. And the um, sometimes it will going to be uh, combined with GBR or build of the ridge itself. Uh, the C is the, about the lateral sinus uh, elevation, which is uh, going to be uh, either a simultaneous implant placement or delayed implant placement, or combination between delayed and GBR. And we're going to discuss this in details. Uh, the summary for uh, the um, findings of the sinus, let's describe this. It is a little bit debatable, and of course, uh, through the uh, history, actually, a lot of uh, modifications happen to this. Uh, understanding and plus we, we when we get better uh, technology in the implant dentistry so things change but let's talk about if we have more than five millimeter of residual bone at the floor of the sinus then we can easily go ahead and do some uh, crystal sinus elevation through the uh, um, uh, implant osteotomy and get um, around another uh, five millimeter of bone to place our implant which happens to be somewhere between eight to ten millimeters if we have somewhere between three to five millimeter, uh, um, we can go ahead and do our one stage uh, lateral window uh, augmentation, which would happen that we'll go to the lateral window and then we open it, place the implant with the bone graft, and make sure that we elevate this schneiderian membrane down the uh, sinus. Uh, the uh, the third uh, situation is if we have less than three millimeter and there is no uh, possibility to achieve any initial stability. 
of the implant, so we would uh, prefer to go with some delayed. Uh, we'll go with the bone augmentation uh, through the, uh, the sinus, through a lateral sinus window, and then place the implant uh, in the future, uh, probably uh, somewhere between six and nine months. It was well described by Mesh. Uh, Mesh was not the first person to discuss this. He's a very smart uh, prosthodontist, but he could organize the, the whole um, idea in his book. And we will not forget about Brenmark when he talked about the uh, bone to implant contact. So it's obvious whenever we have more bone at the floor of the sinus, we will get better uh, implant stability and then better chances of survival rates. Talking about survival rates, a lot of studies starting from the er early 90s until nowadays uh, showing that we have really high success rate of uh, for implant placement uh, the uh, sinus uh, either by uh, a window lateral window uh, lateral sinus elevation or by the osseotome Jensen Wallace uh, and uh, uh, we have a lot of other uh, colleagues um, that very good either uh, clinical trials and uh, systematic review showing that we have uh, over 90 uh, uh, success rate how about the uh, graphing materials? Uh, and it is really um, uh, and it is wide really and broad about talking about the materials. And sometimes we will be really um, uh, not sure what to use because we have a lot of options for graphing material. I'm going to spend some time talking about the graphing material available and what's, which is better for our sinus augmentation. Um, Let's talk about this new uh, old topic or concept. Girls from in the University of Alabama, they did this study and they showed the that Alabama, we might not need uh, actually to have any uh, bone graft in the sinus meaning that sometimes we put the implant and we just have to maintain the space under the splenderian membrane and the bone eventually will uh, will be uh, formed. Uh, some uh, other studies supported this from Kim and uh, his colleagues uh, talking about uh, there's an animal study showing that we could get some um, good bone uh, formation even without monograft with just space maintaining under the splenderian membrane uh, uh, and other studies show that after three years uh, we could have some stability of the bone formed underneath the splenderian membrane so it's an idea to discuss and it's um, uh, something to put it to put in mind that we might be uh, uh, go back to the original uh, um, the biology that we all know that the bone formation could be with stability and space maintaining mainly and it, it will reflect exactly to the, to the sinus itself. But the, for the grafting materials, usually when we do our sinus procedures, we use some grafting materials. And uh, to go a little bit uh, quick uh, for an overview for the um, uh, grafting materials available, autogenous bone graft from the patient, uh, allograft from the same species of the uh, human being, xenografts from some uh, different species happening from animals, and alloplast, the synthetic bone itself. And of course, uh, as the sinus, it is an old uh, topic, a lot of studies show different uh, survival rates. Uh, and um, uh, of course, in 1996, uh, Jensen had this study showing that the Alloplast materials uh, for uh, 163 implants show 98% survival rate for three years and 98% uh, uh, also for five years. Uh, the alloplast xenograft show almost the same for 125 implants, uh, while uh, the allograft itself showing a less uh, success rate, 85% for five years, and the combination between autograft and allograft is 
somehow uh, different, actually, uh, 20, uh, 82 percent as for 33 years. So uh, the, as a conclusion for the graph materials, may, like we can see that the yellow graphs decrease the implant survival rate. Different graphing materials show similar implant survival rate. However, combined material bone graft is preferred. Bone substitute materials are effective as autogenous bone graft. Um, and the long-lasting, long-term over materials uh, like uh, xenograft or uh, the combination between xenograft and the alloplast uh, tend to provide higher success rates. Uh, a very hot topic about like the implant uh, surface and design. Um, I usually um, nowadays we have almost all the surfaces are uh, rough surfaces, but uh, back in the days, uh, um, starting from the 90s, also they showed that the rough surface of the implants show higher successful, significantly higher success rate from the uh, machine surfaces through the implants themselves. Uh, talking about the fixture itself, the design, we should to pay uh, attention when we do uh, simultaneous uh, uh, implant placement with the sinus elevation and to make sure that the implant has some macro structure actually will help to have this um, stability for the implant at the time of placement. And if we pay attention, the coronal third of the implant is very important to be considered so the, this one, it's, uh, it's the main engaging threads uh, into the uh, floor of the sinus uh, bone, which is left before the sinus. So it's a small tip to think about ever before we uh, decide our uh, sinus uh, augmentation and implant placement. And let's start talking about the posterior maxillary atrophy with the lateral window uh, more specifically. And it was well described actually in the... Uh, um, in the, in the literature uh, about the technique and as I said the um, technique was modified for uh, several times we have this good paper from Wallace uh, and uh, Faroon now talking about um, uh, uh, the technique for doing the sinus for augmentation and they set in some numbers and for everybody to put in mind always when we do the sinus uh, augmentation through the lateral window first of all if we have the sinus floor uh, exactly as this lower uh, uh, part more coronal here we need to uh, uh, to start we our cut three millimeter above this uh, sinus floor, mainly to uh, provide some uh, flexibility and some safety for our elevation and to uh, give us some um, um, a safety zone if we have any perforation or any complications uh, into the strained area membrane. Also, we don't really need to have go over 15 millimeter above this uh, the ridge in general for some anatomic, uh, anatomical considerations, which we'll cover uh, now uh, in, in a while. Uh, talking about the size of window, it is uh, debatable also in the literature. Should we go with a bigger size of window or should we go with a smaller size? I would recommend for everybody who is starting their sinus uh, uh, floor uh, techniques, start with the bigger window, which will give them a little bit better uh, um, access to the sinus. While in general, uh, many studies show that when we go like with a smaller window, the success rate will be higher because we are not affecting the sinus in general and the infection in the sinus will be higher post-surgically. Uh, for the anatomy, exactly as we are uh, discussing, we need to be familiar with the uh, sinus anatomy to know that we have the maxillary sinus opening into the nasal cavity here. We have the middle uh, meteos and the medial wall here, which is important to uh, locate during the surgery. And we have the uh, floor of the sinus. Uh, which will we add some bone underneath this land area membrane and to go ahead and to uh, know the, that we have the lateral sinus which can be different in, in the sizes uh, and the thickness actually and differently from the posterior to anterior area. Um, we uh, all know that uh, the um, 
patients with chronic in, uh, infection or chronic inflammation into the sinus would have a thicker Schneiderian membrane. So sometimes smokers would have like almost uh, two millimeters of Schneiderian mem membrane, which will have um, better quality to work. Of course, it's not a better for success of implants. Some imp some uh, uh, sinuses would have different some imp some uh, um, structures actually either by having some mucus cells inside the sinuses or uh, to have some septums will uh, will divide the sinus into different rooms. Uh, in this case, uh, we we might be uh, tend to go with two windows to avoid this uh, buccal to lingual all the way lateral to medial wall uh, symptom. So we have some challenging cases in the sinuses that we should consider before we attempt to do any surgery. Talking about the bleeding, uh, we have the blood supply for the maxillary sinus. We should understand the concept of those. Understand uh, the uh, small arteries. Uh, we have the uh, intraosseous uh, anastomosis and the uh, epiperiosteal anastomosis, which is uh, well described by Solor and colleagues that this uh, um, intraosseous inside the bone actually uh, a small artery would be somewhere between 18 and 19 millimeter above the ridge, and this um, uh, the uh, uh, epiperiosteal uh, artery, small one, would be somewhere between 23 to 26 millimeter, uh, which may cause some uh, bleeding in the surgery. So before we cut our window, we should consider this anatomy. Uh, for the surgical keys, after we understand the anatomy of the sinus, and it's a good diagram that uh, I worked on actually. This is the floor of the sinus. This is the medial wall inside, and this is the lateral wall, and this is the window. Usually, we use some rotary burrs to open our window, and then we should consider that the Schneiderian membrane it is somewhere between 0.3 millimeter to 0.8 millimeter, as I mentioned. With the uh, uh, chronic inflammation, it might be uh, thicker. And we should understand that the lateral wall uh, bone, uh, bone is, is somewhere between uh, one millimeters. When we go a little bit toward the zygoma, it's going to be thicker. So we should know, be oriented when we do our cut. Uh, the overall uh, window, um, uh, the coronal apical width, should be somewhere between 10 to 15 millimeter. We don't really need bigger than this, considering the anatomical uh, um, structures that we discussed earlier. Uh, and uh, as we said, the very and, uh, coronal cut for the window said, should be at least three millimeter above the uh, sinus floor itself to give us some flexibility. And the elevation should be all the way from the floor of the sinus uh, to the medial wall in most of the cases, and uh, we'll discuss this point later on. Uh, so you see the space, we have good space to place our implant or to place our bone graft itself depending on the remaining bone at the floor of the sinus. Uh, talking about the uh, using the rotary bird direction uh, to the, uh, the uh, bone itself for the lateral uh, window, lateral uh, uh, wall of, of the sinus. So as we know, we have the bone and we have the membrane underneath, and we use the burr actually, which uh, usually used to be uh, round burr. Personally, I prefer to use the diamond round burr. It's a little bit safer and easier to work with. We don't want to put the burr uh, perpendicular directly into the bone, the simply because when we uh, are doing our uh, um, work, we might go all the way down to the thinarian membrane and have a perforation and have this complication. The better way is to do it like with the 45 degrees, tilted a little bit so we can control more even if we uh, enter the sinus during the work. Uh, we have to do, know that nowadays it's we can start with the rotary burrs, but we might end with the safe cut for uh, the piezo surgery of the ultrasonic technology that we have. Uh, we have a lot of 
good instruments in the market to uh, mainly elevate the sinus, these manual instruments, uh, sinus uh, uh, lift kits. It's really uh, in different shapes with different angulation, mainly to uh, help us to reach every single corner around the window to reflect our schneiderian membrane. All of them are safe and non-cutting. Of course, we need to learn how to use them. And the golden tip is to keep the uh, the whole instrument in touch with the bone all the time while doing a reflection, while we are pushing our schneiderian membrane uh, um, to the top. And uh, after having or after creating our base, um, good base of uh, knowledge for the literature, uh, um, science, so to see some cases, and let's see this case. This is my uh, patient. Uh, he is uh, 52 years old. He came to me with the missing number three. Of course, he had a lot of other issues, including uh, some periapical lesion on tooth number four, and tooth number two was failing. And we can evaluate that we have around three millimeters to four millimeters of residual bone. The tooth was extracted several years ago and uh, the uh, overall uh, uh, classification here uh, that we decided to go with the sinus. It is a C uh, according to Wang and Katranji, and uh, we decided to go with a, a lateral window augmentation with simultaneous implantation. First of all, as I said, num well, tooth number two all, had like location involvement and uh, active carries, so uh, it failed and we had to extract it. Uh, it's very important nowadays to include our sinus or uh, three-dimensional comb beam scan to study the sinuses before attempting to do any uh, sinus elevation. It's not a standard of care yet, but for me, I would prefer to know exactly what's going on inside the sinus, especially if we saw any um, different uh, or uh, abnormal structures inside the uh, sinus through our panoramic um, uh, radiograph or the PA. Uh, we can see that the both uh, sinuses are clear and we don't really have any symptoms in, in, in the sinus. We mainly uh, uh, we mainly uh, confirm that we have around three millimeters. This nadirian membrane seems to be um, thin. Uh, we can't really tell from the uh, comb beam CT scan. Might be with MRI, but uh, the case is ready to go for a sinus uh, 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 lateral window uh, sinus floor augmentation with the uh, simultaneous implant placement. So for this case. Uh, uh, I mean, it's very important so to uh, case, go over uh, the I mean, sinus all uh, three-dimensionally with the CT scan the to know exactly to orient ourselves with the sinuses and as I'm showing you here, to know exactly if we can see any of the arteries, uh, the intraosseous arteries to plan ahead if we have any uh, um, uh, structures there, uh, anatomical structures. So the flat reflection would be uh, we should be uh, not we should we should open a good flap to to do the uh, sinus window um, and uh, in this case I chose to drop a vertical here at the mesial of tooth number five the premolar and it's a tip very important to go to go perpendicular to the or gingival margin so we can have better healing with no clefts remain uh, there. Full thickness flap is uh, important actually, and this is the window that we create. Remember, we have around three millimeters, and then we uh, got the cut around six millimeter above the uh, uh, crystal, uh, the ridge of the uh, crest of the ridge, and then the window is almost around uh, 10 millimeter in width. And this is the tips that we use for the piezo surgery. Personally, I use this uh, OT5. Personally, which will, uh, uh, after using the rotary uh, burr for uh, our initial cut, we uh, use it to penetrate the sinus. And um, as we know, we have uh, uh, 
risk and, um, of having any complication. We'll talk about this uh, down the road, but I tend usually to enter my sinus into the distal uh, apical uh, part here or to the mesial part, which is um, less um, dangerous uh, of having a perforation. Usually it is um, known that we might have uh, the perforation uh, when we first uh, uh, enter into the sinus. Minus, which is um, it's better to be in a safe zone uh, down the road. We have other tips to mainly smooth the ridges of the window, and other one. This one is for some um, to help us with the uh, implant osteotomy itself. And um, we can and see our measurements here. We have around uh, uh, 10 millimeters here. of the we window. We are uh, pretty uh, six millimeter above the uh, sinus. Uh, so um, uh, it is a straightforward uh, window uh, before we penetrate the sinus and the distal uh, apical uh, the sinus mm, the distal angle apical here of the, uh, of the window. Uh, it's uh, well known that, as I said, we have the uh, ridge, we have well three millimeter of said, the, the bone the uh, height of the sinus floor, and then I went around three millimeter above this to give us some uh, uh, stability or safety for the si for the membrane uh, elevation. This is the membrane after I'm completing the cut, and this part is a little bit move, uh, mobile right now. We have this. Uh, um, Piezo surgery yeah, this, sinus uh, kit, which has like our Piezo gold uh, um, burrs or uh, our tips, gold, which is going to be uh, uh, for bone cutting, and our silver uh, tips, which is going to be for safety cutting into the uh, sinus itself. Usually, after I mobilize this cut, I use this uh, trumpet uh, shaped uh, tip to. Elevate the sinus uh, and 360 degrees around it, and then we can use those both safe uh, tips to go all over around the sinuses. And we need to make sure that we are not elevating more than what we need. The most important thing is to have the sinus, the schneiderian membrane, elevated into the at least the medial wall, especially if we are doing two-stage surgeries. And using our instruments, hand instruments will help us pushing the schneiderian membrane. And, and as, like, as reminding with the tip, we need to make sure that the instruments is touching the bone all the time, so it will be safe and sound. Uh, the window would be mobile after we complete our uh, elevation, and uh, as a tip, I can go almost like six, seven millimeter uh, around the window to make sure we have good mobility of the uh, of the window and the small. Uh, a video show us that this, we have a sign when we ask the patient to uh, breathe mainly so we have the sign of uh, fully mobility of the, the whole membrane with the window itself and uh, which will give us the uh, sign that we don't have perforation at least. A big question, what should we do with this window? Should we keep it with the uh, attached to the membrane or should we remove it and use it as the bone graft? And simply the answer is if we have thick membrane, maybe it's not a bad idea to uh, to, to remove it and use it uh, as a bone graft, most probably we don't know until we reflect. So uh, it's it's a better uh, uh, to keep it attached to the membrane to avoid any uh, possible perforation and just lift it and make it as a, a ceiling of the whole bone graft we use it. Very important question: How far should we go to the medial wall? So if we're gonna do the bone graft with the implant, how far how far should we go to uh, the medial wall? And the answer is um, depends on the anatomy. We have our sinus opening. We don't really need to block this because it's going to be absolutely a big problem with a lot of infections, especially if we are using some particles bone, which will end up with um, uh, if we end up with uh, any um, perforation or if we lift the mucinary membrane a little bit more apical, we'll end up a blockage of the sinus and infection down the road. The answer for this is if we are doing simultaneous Simultaneous implant placement, the for this and we uh, we are doing the sinus elevation at the same time. And we, 
we don't really need to go all the way to the medial wall. We need to remember that we need around 3 to 4 mm of bone graft around the implant. So if we know already the uh, uh, location of the implant, we might be able to reflect uh, as much as we can and we put our bone graft at the medial uh, uh, aspect of the implant, placing the implant and continue to place our uh, bone graft after placing the implant. But if we are mainly, we are doing delayed implant placement, so we don't know the exact location for the implant at the time of placement, it is better idea to go to be really well prepared to go all the way to the medial wall and place our bone graft uh, in the manner that it's going to get uh, bone all over uh, around the uh, implant down the road. Uh, going back to the bone graft materials, where should, what should we use? Personally, I use a mixture between autogenous and the xenograft materials, and I use some uh, sandwich technique uh, as described by um, the... Um, um, by Boozer and, and the groups, so mainly uh, I uh, collect some autogenous from the area. So if I did not really I, remove uh, the window, I use the scraper area. to uh, collect some uh, autogenous monograph and mix it to the 50 50 uh, with the uh, xenograft. And I will use uh, the remaining of the xenograft to close the final layer of the window itself. So mainly it's a good combination to have some xenograft and to mix it with the autogenous uh, monograft 50 to 50 and then use some of the xenograft to the final layer of the window itself. Uh, starting the uh, drilling should be really we should really pay attention to this because we don't really have the, we don't really need to have the uh, complication through the drilling. We should put our instrument to protect the uh, membrane. For me myself, I prefer to push some bone graft to the medial aspect of the of the sinus before I start even drilling, uh, so the membrane will be elevated and safe, and um, I can see exactly what's uh, what's going on in the sinus. It's always better to have our surgical guide to give us the better uh, all the best location for the implant placement and this is the final osteotomy for the implant showing that we have like really uh, safe and sound um, uh, secondary membrane into the sinus itself and at the end we uh, make sure that we are placing the uh, monograph before even sure placing the implant, and as I said, I prefer to do it uh, uh, even if I'm, le I'm losing some monograph, but I prefer to use it mainly uh, during the uh, osteotomy and the drilling. Placing the implant with uh, um, good uh, initial stability to uh, use it. I have some advanced tricks here to achieve my. Uh, initial stability, but remember always we talked about the coronal uh, third of the implant, which is the part that we are going to get the uh, the stability of the implant. So we should pay attention to this uh, pretty uh, well. Uh, and after placing the implants, we did the, we do the final uh, layer of the bone graft ab above the window, uh, and which which I used to do it with the xenograft. Uh, material, uh, I, I uh, tend to always do uh, control um, um, the uh, PA during the surgery because sometimes the gravity will take the bone graft to the posterior area while placing. So sometimes we need to add a little bit of bone graft to the mesial uh, uh, aspect of the implant. Uh, so it's a good way to control our part. And um, so what should we do with the, with the with the windows? As as I said before, some people would say, uh, let's uh, take the window itself and put it back again to uh, close the window and stabilize it with the adjacent bone or surrounding bone. Some other people would say, uh, let's go with the xenograft as I mentioned here. Uh, but there are some studies saying, like, let's place a membrane, collagen uh, membrane, over the window, saying, which like, Tarno and Faroum and different studies, they showed slightly better survival rate with using the window. Uh, so we chose uh, to go with a, a, a collagen membrane. Some uh, people would recommend to do two layers of membrane as the Switzerland group from the ITI. 
Um, and um, as an oral surgeon, you know that whenever we have our periosteum uh, really uh, intact, so we might not need to have uh, to, to do any membrane. Uh, so in this case, I use the collagen membrane and then the final closure with the primary closure, making sure that we are getting our um, uh, uh, resorbable uh, uh, sutures actually here at the vertical, and then I use the uh, PTFE uh, sutures at the uh, closure of the uh, uh, main wound, and we can see a six month of post uh, post surgical post surgically. We don't really have. Um, any complications, we don't have any infection, or we don't have any uh, radiographic signs of any failing by any means. Um, this is a second stage surgery. It happened to be after six months in this case, and usually I wait somewhere between six to nine months, depending on the uh, initial stability of the implant and, of course, the remaining bone on the floor of the sinus and the healing cap for a while and then before we proceed with the uh, with the final or for our restoration I usually make sure that I uh, I am uh, comfortable with that uh, I use the ISQ the implant stability meter just to make sure that the implant is stable and it is mainly uh, it is a magnetic vibration uh, machine would show us some numbers and uh, whenever we get uh, numbers above 70 that means that the implant is integrated and it is uh, stable in this case we had an 81 isq uh, number and then i felt really comfortable to proceed with uh, our restoration uh, in some cases, um, like this case, it was a um, comprehensive case. I chose to go with some temporary crowns to um, make sure that everything is okay with other uh, areas. It is a, um, a temporary abutment with a composite uh, or acrylic crown. Uh, of course, it is screw retained, and this is the final restoration, which has happened to be also screw retained. And this is one year. You can see the stability of the uh, bone graft and the stability of the uh, bone itself around the coronal side of the implant. We need to know that we are expecting to have some resorption for the bone graft uh, within the first uh, six months. Uh, sometimes uh, it is quoted to be 20 to 25 percent in the uh, xenograft. Um, yeah, so uh, this is why we put our limits of bone graft surrounding the implant somewhere between three to four millimeters. How about complications? Like after we saw the surgery and this case, and we know exactly what we're talking about regarding the lateral window augmentation. The complications in, in the lateral window is a lot. So let's let's talk about uh, membrane perforation, fracture of the residual alveolar ridge, uh, uh, obstruction of the maxillary osteum, uh, bleeding and hemorrhage, uh, acute chronic infection following the maxillary. Believe me, if you have a case with the maxillary infection, it is going to be so hard to deal with. Uh, unfortunately, in this uh, um, in this presentation, it's hard to cover the uh, uh, whole uh, complication uh, uh, actions that, that we can do. Uh, oroantral fistula and chronic pain, chronic sinus disease. This is again uh, according to Jensen uh, uh, One of the most important complications is the perforation for of the Schneiderian membrane. And mainly the importance of the perforation for the Schneiderian membrane is because we are uh, using most of the time, we are using uh, some particles, and if we have any perforation, we might end up with some particles going inside the sinus and closing the sinus, uh, opening into the, uh, the, the uh, drainage into the nasal uh, bone, and then uh, we will um, have some infections down the road. Uh, nowadays, a lot of other um, materials are suggested to use uh, something like the PRF or something like the um, sticky bone just to mix the xenograft with some of the uh, um, PRF materials that we might uh, use. So we'll then we'll have like a bulk of uh, grafting materials to put in there even if we have perforation it will be safer to, to deal with. But this is a very good slide to talk about the uh, perforation rate between rotating and ultrasonic 
um, uh, uh, machines mainly. And we can easily see that with the rotation with the burrs, we have uh, like an average of 30% of perforation rate, while in the ultrasonic, we have somewhere between uh, around 5% five, five of the uh, perforation rate, which is uh, which makes sense which to is, always uh, use the ultrasonic, the piezo surgery at the, um, the uh, surgery at the, uh, uh, especially when we uh, enter the sinus itself. Um, Perforation-wise, we, we uh, as uh, I um, told you before, we have some classification we, uh, for the perforation. Uh, Vlasis, uh, in 1999, and his colleagues, they did this nice uh, paper, actually, um, they did this mainly describing uh, the perforation and location mainly. mainly and we, where they show it in the high risk and the low risk in the uh, perforation. So if we say like this is the distal and this is the mesial uh, of the window, we have less uh, complicated uh, into the uh, mesial and distal apical angles of the window, which is less problematic. We can manage this easily while it's going to be very high risk to have a perforation in the middle underneath the window. As I said, this is why sometimes it's good just to leave it there. And uh, the uh, um, Class 4 would be with more coronal aspect of the perfection. For this exact reason, I repeat this, I prefer to enter the sinus or to just cut into the bone directly into the sinus through these two angles and then I will start working with my piezo surgery laterally to get my bony window. So this is something to put in mind. Uh, other studies show that the size of perforation will affect the uh, uh, the whole survival rate for the implants. And this is Hernandez and Alfaro in 2008. They showed that the perforation less than 5 millimeter and with good um, uh, actions taken to uh, manage the perforation, we have around a 97% survival rate, while up if we have perforation more than 10 millimeters, the survival rate dropped into 74%. So it is important to know how to deal with uh, the perforation because it's going to happen with everybody using or doing the sinus uh, um, elevation procedures. So mainly when we do the lateral window and we have a, a perforation, we will end up with having some um, um, me collagen membrane to protect this uh, perforation and to protect the sinuses. Let's see a case with a perforation. Actually, in this case, the Snyderian membrane uh, was very thin and I had two perforations. This one here it is a class one and this one is a class four, which is high risk. And what to do here is we need to pass over this perforation, make sure we are elevating the membrane without getting the perforation bigger, which is sometimes very hard. Some people would say, like, I can suture it. I can assure you that we, if you have, like, 0.3 or 0.5 millimeter of the membrane, whenever you are going to do suturing, is going to be bigger, and so don't attempt it at all. So you go with the bony window. You try to make it bigger. This is why we have the safety of three millimeters mainly down and then we'll start to elevate the the whole window uh, or the whole snyderian membrane passing around the uh, the perforation and you can see here even with all this uh, um, um, uh, steps that we took we still have the perforation a little bit bigger and then uh, down the road after we elevate to the uh, amount that we need we can put our uh, collagen membrane to uh, to be as a, a ceiling of the uh, uh, of the bone graft, and then we'll end up with placing our implants exactly as prescribed before and uh, protected with the membrane. This is the case after the surgery directly, so we don't have any um, um, any problems from the perforation. We don't have any bone graft getting into the sinus itself, and this is the case after six months when we went that when I went to the uh, second stage surgery itself. Uh, so you can see the bone graft is stable after six months. We have some resorption which is acceptable and the three implants are uh, just surviving well. 
Uh, the other complication that I need to talk about is the bleeding, and it is sometimes it's gonna be awful to have like this bleeding. The main thing we need to do is we need to control the bleeding during the surgery, and it happens all the time. We need to control it during the surgery. We don't really need to patient to go with an active bleeding. Uh, we need to try to um, uh, eliminate any swelling or bruising because it is a good um, a reason to have infection or to have any failing or uh, wound dehiscence. So uh, remember this again with me. So we have the incidence of the EA happening 44% and the incidence of having the IA here, the intraosseous, would be like the yeah, 100%. And both of them are arteries. The lower one, the intraosseous, as uh, described by, well described by a lot of um, uh, cadaver study with Solar and his colleagues, uh, that it is somewhere between 18 to 19 millimeter above the uh, the ridge, and the EA it is somewhere between 23 to 26 millimeter above the uh, ridge itself. So if you put like in, in, in your mind that we're going to do like lateral window, remember that we are having somewhere between uh, two to or one millimeter to five millimeter, and then we'll go above this three millimeter to cut, so it is eight millimeter, and then we're gonna do around uh, eight millimeter of the window. So we are borderlines, we need to know that we don't really need to go above that if we can avoid it. Uh, so this is uh, the uh, Topics we're talking about so the lateral the window augmentation uh, for the sinus uh, floor augmentation, and uh, it's, um, uh, it's time to talk about the other technique, which is uh, the uh, uh, sinus floor augmentation with a crystal approach. Some people would love to say it's osteotome or internal sinus elevation. And as we said, it was well described by Summers. And uh, in 1994, we have different uh, osteotomes in the market, and this is the original Summers technique. Now, ten every single uh, dental implant uh, company would have their own uh, osteotome. We should be aware that we have two different osteotome, one for expanding, bone expanding, and this is the one that is correct for the, the bone, uh, um, uh, the sinus floor elevation through the, through the crystal approach, because we have this uh, concavity uh, area which will be fracturing the whole floor of the sinus, giving, uh, giving us an access into the uh, sinus to place our bone graft and implant down the road. So, um, uh, it's, uh, of course, is going to uh, do some so, other um, uh, bone expanding also, but the elevation uh, should be with uh, the, uh, in the the osteotome prescribed uh, as uh, Summers uh, 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 described uh, in 1994. Uh, so uh, let's talk about the technique itself. We have, so of course, we have always to get ourselves oriented with mainly some round bird to make sure we are good and then we have to start our pilot drill with the strict length uh, um, uh, control actually so remember we have here we have somewhere between uh, five to eight millimeters so we need to go with our drills one millimeter down uh, away from the floor of the sinus and then uh, after that uh, we will keep this intact and we'll start getting a bigger osteotomy so we can get into our final osteotomy which is the final diameter of the implant and then we'll use our osteotome to uh, fracture the whole the floor of the sinus inside the sinus and then make sure that um, we have an access to the bone graft itself. We'll end up with a small uh, part of the floor of the sinus fractured with the medarium membrane elevated and then we'll start putting our bone graft which will end up pushing the, uh, the whole uh, membrane uh, to the apical side giving us some uh, um, uh, space mainly to place our implants. Remember, we don't need to push our osteotome. This is a very, uh, um, very um, uh, 
uh, it, uh, everybody like uh, like at the very beginning uh, of the, the sinus uh, carrier they do this like mistake you don't really need to push the osteotome to the whole uh, length of the implant you need only to use your osteotome for the length of the residual bone left there so for example if we have like five millimeter of bone left we only enter the uh, osteotome only for five millimeter it is extra safety and the bonograft, after we push it, is going to be pushed and uh, creating our good space for implant placement down the road itself. Um, so let's talk about the case, some good case here. We have this patient coming to us. She has around, I see, six millimeters of residual bone. She extracted the tooth. She had the, the, the tooth extracted like uh, three years ago. And we have some sinus pneumatization. Um, can we go with a short implant? Of course we can. Um, it's a, another big discussion. Another alternative for um, uh, sinus uh, pneumatization. And the short implants. It's not the topic of this presentation. We can discuss this in a different presentation. And we chose here to do like osteotome with simultaneous implant placement and sinus invasion. Uh, you can see that we did this, um, uh, the uh, incision itself. I, I, usually I spend some time to orient myself to see exactly where is the center of the implant that I'm going to place and uh, I'm expecting here to do two stage or two uh, one stage implant meaning that I'm expecting to do the healing abutment at the same time of the implant so I planned my incision in the way that I can use as much as I can to retinize gingiva uh, into the buckle so it will be protecting the implant from uh, uh, 360 degrees reflecting of the uh, of the flap full thickness flap to see exactly where we get the um, bone actually and the ridge width and then we do our orientation with seeing like the mesial distal space and putting our surgical slash radiographic guide to know exactly where are we at. This is our, our first drill. As I described, we have around six millimeter only. So I went only around five millimeter and I spent, I left like one millimeter down the floor of the sinus uh, for safety. And then uh, I went all the way to my final drill with the uh, one millimeter intact. After that, I will go ahead and place my osteotome to place our implant to, to mainly fracture the floor of the sinus itself and do this uh, fracturing into the uh, uh, under the schneiderian membrane. And of course, uh, we need to add our bone graft. In this case, tend to have only xenograft. Uh, a small tip here that you see that the buckle flap I used to just to tuck it underneath, and it gives me very good um, uh, uh, visibility, and I can see what I'm doing at least. Uh, every scoop of the bone graft will give us somewhere between uh, uh, 0.5 to 0.7 millimeter of the uh, height of the bone. If, uh, uh, so mainly we need to count the the scoops and the so bone graft, and remember always we can always take a, a, a radiographic X-ray to see exactly where are we at. And uh, the, another uh, golden tip that we don't really need to go all the way with the length of the implant itself. In this case, I went for a 10 millimeter implant, and I have good initial stability for the implant, and which will which allowed me to place our healing abutment. Uh, as I described before, and then at the very end, it's fine to do some good initial, like some uh, soft tissue management. See here, we have like around seven millimeters of attached gingiva, so I chose to do some palachi technique of having some, creating some papillae and making better adaptation for the flap around the implant itself. And the final sutures with the PTFE sutures showing that we have enough, like uh, three uh, millimeters, around three millimeters of attached gingiva uh, to, the, uh, to the buckle of the uh, implant itself. This is at the day of the surgery, and this is the final restoration. Uh, I think it's six month follow up for the uh, uh, implant itself. We have some new techniques to do some internal sinus elevation. It is not recommended to start with this advanced 
as techniques. It's always good to start only with our um, uh, traditional way, and then you can uh, uh, you can uh, jump into some uh, new techniques, uh, uh, such like the osseo densification burrs uh, that uh, uh, we have uh, we have uh, a paper going on right now. We don't have publications supporting this yet, but I mean, uh, Dr. Uh, Weiss and Dr. Mazor working on uh, new publications should be soon right now, and it is um, it will use the bone itself to uh, to uh, safely enter the sinus and elevate the sinus floor with the uh, option of having some uh, bone grafts also around the implant if needed. And the other way is to do the hydraulic uh, sinus membrane elevation after using uh, some um, the, the old way of using some balloon to expand the or to reflect the uh, sinus membrane. The membrane uh, we have some new kits that will give safe cuts into the whole uh, floor of the sinus and then use the power of the water itself to elevate the membrane and then place the imprints anyhow so this is about the sinus I would recommend this book it's my uh, mainly uh, Bible for the sinus bone graft uh, uh, Jensen uh, he's, um, he's located in um, Colorado, I think, here in the U.S., and it's a book. It is old and new. You can uh, find everything about the sinus through this book. And, of course, we have a lot of other publications and big names with the sinuses that we're all proud of. So this is about the sinus, and now um, I'm going to proceed with um, the time that left with to talk about the anterior maxilla atrophy. And in this case, I want to uh, concentrate mainly with the uh, fully edentulism uh, patients with no uh, teeth at all. Um, so sometimes when we do the extraction, and especially with patients having so some uh, full, uh, complete dentures, they have some uh, significant, um, significant um, bone uh, uh, resorption or uh, maxillary atrophy, and we see it all the time, like like this X-ray. We can see that we don't have enough bone here. It's almost like four millimeters of uh, height, we don't have enough width of the bone also, so we have, um, we need some time to have options, especially when patients, they don't accept the uh, complete denture anymore. Uh, the options in, in the anterior uh, uh, maxillary atrophy is either to do three-dimensional uh, um, uh, three GBR uh, to do some attempt for horizontal augmentation or for uh, vertical augmentation, ridge reconstruction, either by means of blocks or particulates, or to do some implant placement in the nasopalatine canal, uh, especially if you are aiming to have any fixed detachable hybrid uh, um, restorations. Uh, and this, uh, the third option is to do some implant placement uh, with the nasal floor augmentation, especially when we don't have enough height of bone. So we will attempt to put our implants and try to do the same concept of the sinus floor augmentation, but with the nasal floor augmentation itself. And uh, I'm going to go uh, really quick through the options we have to do the uh, premaxilla. The first one is to do some orthognathic surgery, and it is well described by Bussman and Bender, uh, coming from the 1930s all the way to 1960s, and has a lot of modifications to give us better horizontal and vertical augmentation. It's an advanced surgery, of course. Distraction osteogenesis described well by Chen 1985 to do either vertical and sometimes it's so challenging to do any horizontal augmentation through the uh, distraction but it is an option for our verticals or to do some bone graft to rebuild the uh, the ridge, uh, either by autogenous bone or by ridge splitting or the blocks itself. The other uh, technique is to uh, do our implant placement in the incisive canal or the nasal palatine canal. It is something um, um, 
really uh, interesting to try because some people would have would not have enough bone width uh, or le or height, and then we have the structure in the three maxilla that is there. We have enough um, bone around this uh, um, canal, and then we can utilize it to place our implants, especially when we have fully edentulated cases to uh, place uh, to support any fixed detachable or uh, any hybrid uh, restorations and uh, mainly it's well described by the in the literature and mainly it's well described by the uh, 2013 he did this systematic review seeing what's uh, the literature covering this and mainly the first guy who uh, tried this uh, technique is Ronsquist in 1992 and he described in the world organized paper that he is going to um, inculate uh, the uh, uh, the bundle into canal try to uh, place a collagen uh, membrane there put some bone graft and then engage an implant after osteotomy we see like high success rate in this uh, our colleague from the University of Washington Berardi uh, published this paper in uh, 2012 showing the uh, uh, proof of concept of doing the implant placement in the size of canal. Uh, so it's an, just an idea that we have this in our back pocket. Uh, so it's our main subject is to discuss the nasal floor elevation for implant placement, especially with the fully edentulism, uh, edentulous maxilla, excuse me. Uh, and the nasal floor elevation was described by Keller, 1994, and after that we had several um, uh, modifications for the technique, and we have several good uh, publications uh, with uh, Dr. Moy and Dr. Garib uh, um, showing this in uh, the Journal of Maxillofacial Surgery. It's a case report showing that we are able to, in the case of uh, uh, vertical deficiency, we are able to go underneath the nasal uh, membrane, place our implants, and augment the bone graft uh, down. Uh, and, um, of course, with um, uh, caution and with good planning. Uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Mazur and uh, uh, Rosende also, they describe the technique very well. And the summary is we can do this technique. It's easier than the sinus floor elevation. We have uh, hundred, like we have a, a direct access to the uh, nasal membrane, so we don't have the high possibility of doing perforation. The nasal membrane is a little bit thicker. And then we can, uh, the, mainly the patient Patients will not feel it if we did at least somewhere between four to five, uh, a maximum four to five millimeter of elevation. We don't really need to go further. Other than that, the patient will start to feel it through the uh, uh, nostrils mainly, um, and we don't have a lot of uh, complications uh, associated with this technique. So let's see the technique itself. Uh, so Rosende, uh, like they described, that we're going to do the full uh, thickness flap, we will uh, we'll like expose the uh, nasal floor flap. itself, we'll, we'll, we'll and we'll, we'll start our sinus instrumentations to elevate the nasal elevate, uh, membrane itself, uh, making a good space in the nasal floor, and uh, do our magic with putting some bone graft and implants, exactly as prescribed. Uh, 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 exactly described by the uh, sinus uh, 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 floor elevation sinus. itself. So let's talk about some um, a case uh, that uh, uh, received. This is my patient. She's 48. She's been with four implants and the bar holding a removable denture. And now she is really tired of this, and she's seeking some uh, bone, uh, some uh, fixed detachable hybrid. Uh, um, uh, restoration, which is, as you can see, we have a big span here. It's really risky to put some fixed detachable uh, denture or uh, restoration over like this big span. So we need at least one implant to support our fixed detachable. And unfortunately, the patient went before coming to me went through several bone graft uh, procedures that was that were not successful. So she did not really have a lot of bone left. We can see that the implants for implants plants have been there for uh, for a while and they have some remodeling around them while in the anterior area we have somewhere around 
about 45 millimeter left under the sinus, uh, the floor uh, of the uh, nasal floor mainly. So uh, the CT scan is showing significant bone resorption around the uh, premaxilla in both dimensions, horizontally and vertically. Uh, placing one implant in the incisive canal is something we can consider. In this case, we decided to do two implants in the lateral uh, area to support the fixed detachable. And considering that we have only five millimeter of residual bone, so we needed to place uh, an implant with another uh, three to five millimeter to uh, elevate our uh, bone uh, uh, nasal floor uh, itself so this is the concept we're gonna uh, do the uh, surgery we're gonna so access the, the nasal floor gonna, uh, elevate the, the membrane surgery. which is a thick we're membrane and we will try to place our implant in a good restorative, restorative uh, position that the um, we can utilize it and the down the into the fixed detachable restoration the my colleague uh, the uh, restorative dentist requested at my least one to two uh, implants in the anterior maxilla so he can be um, uh, acceptable fixed detachable case or um, of course he showed flexibility for the uh, buccal lingual uh, aspect of the implants or location of the implants so we decided to go a little bit more palatal so we can get uh, good bone to implant contact exactly at those space for the surgery after removing the bar carefully because it's a long span it's a good fracture the incision uh, is avoiding the uh, adjacent implants uh, itself uh, and then the reflection with the full thickness flap would happen to expect to mainly to expose the uh, not both uh, nostrils with the uh, with the nasal uh, floor itself as you uh, as you can the see the uh, nasal uh, membrane is uh, thicker than the sinus membrane it's easier to uh, manipulate it and to elevate it um, and uh, we make sure that we are having our uh, space to place our implant and bone graft in this case I did like eight millimeter implants so I needed around five millimeter of augmentation so I can place my implant safely there uh, sometimes we need to uh, make our dissection all the way to the nasal spine here to give this elevation for the tissues uh, it's very important to explore the uh, area and make sure that we're not getting all the way down to the uh, back of the uh, of the uh, nasal cavity so we need to do uh, enough uh, uh, reflection with um, with the space needed to place our implant itself and uh, the same concepts of uh, reflection of the membrane that we used for the uh, sinus is to keep our instruments in contact with the bone all the time while we are reflecting the whole thing um, um, in this case we have uh, at the right side we have less bone res res uh, residual bone uh, than the left side we uh, decided to uh, manipulate this down the road with the uh, uh, abutment of the uh, implants placed and of course because the patient had several uh, bone graft procedures he already have the bundle of the incisive bundle, bundle uh, it's already uh, included uh, so it was not a big deal with us to deal with uh, placing of the or uh, uh, drilling of with the uh, side of the implant would be really uh, uh, carefully to uh, just uh, protect the nasal uh, membrane because in, the, in those cases the, the main perforation will happen through the drilling so we need to avoid this as much as we can careful drilling with supporting or protection of the membrane is essential and then we can easily um, as you can see here we have the drilling giving our osteotomy in the side of the uh, uh, implant and um, we will have here a little bit uh, more uh, flexibility of getting uh, initial stability for the implants after having like uh, uh, bicortical uh, fixation uh, because the implant is getting um, engaged into the cortical bone here in the ridge and the cortical bone at the uh, nasal floor itself as I mentioned before we have 
the left side is a little bit longer or the residual bone is high as thicker or uh, the remaining height is bigger than the right side and what we decided to do is to put the implant at one um, and what we uh, to follow the ridge and to uh, compensate this uh, um, uh, discrepancy down with the uh, implant abutments all the way. And then placing the bone graft, in this case it happened to be xenograft, which is long lasting, or the turnover is um, longer than other bone grafts. And as we discussed on the sinus, it's similar to the same uh, concept. And uh, this is the tip that placing the bonograft before placing the implant is essential to give three-dimensional uh, uh, augmentation around the implant itself. Uh, good implant stability, uh, in this case I achieved like around 14 Newton centimeter in both implants. Uh, and both implants in place, uh, we have the initial uh, bone graft placed, and then we place uh, some we more bone graft. Of course, all the remnants will be clean before closure, and then, uh, of course, in, uh, in this case, it was uh, two stage uh, implants. I don't want to do a compromise. Uh, uh, the uh, the site, uh, so I choose to put some uh, um, closure screws over my implants, and uh, exactly as um, uh, well uh, um, described in the sinus literature, we uh, wanted to do some collagen membrane to cover the whole area and make sure we're getting good healing there. Uh, so this is the day of surgery after I, I put back the uh, bar and the patient could go back for her um, uh, denture, like removable denture over the bar. And this is the, the bone graft uh, at the day of the surgery showing like good implant stability. And exactly as I told you on the right side, because it was a little bit higher, I was not able to uh, place a higher, a higher bone around the implant because I don't want to uh, pass the 5 millimeter of the bone augmentation. Uh, the patient uh, did not really uh, suffer from a lot of uh, post-surgical complications. This is 10 days. You can see that the patient is just doing fine. We don't have a lot of bruising or uh, a swelling. Um, and uh, this is three weeks post-op after healing. We had some deficiency here in the soft tissue that we decided to take care of at the second stage surgery down the uh, in the future, and this is three weeks post-op. The patient is happy. At least she's getting implants, and she's on the on the track to have like her fixed detachable, uh, uh, fixed detachable prosthesis. Um, and this is three months of uh, the post-op. Uh, you can compare the day of the surgery. Uh, um, radiograph and the six month post op we don't have that huge or significant bone resorption um, and the implant is healing well so this is the uh, seven month I, I re-entered this case at the seven month to do our second stage placing my healing abutments the implants in a good position to do to receive our um, 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 bar for the um, fixed detachable uh, screw retained hybrid restoration and uh, this is the case after seven months of the um, uh, of the placement. So the case is still going through uh, the restorative work. I don't have her last um, financial uh, prosthetic uh, um, restorative work yet. So this is overall, I tried to cover, it's a little bit above an hour, so I tried to cover the um, both the maxillary posterior atrophy and the anterior maxillary atrophy. And uh, as a summary, we can choose between those three things to uh, either to utilize the uh, uh, our window surgical uh, lateral window sinus augmentation. Uh, we are comfortable right now to with the with the good literature and evidence base, or we can do our osteotome lateral augmentation and to have the. Um, the anterior maxilla, either to do the nasopalatine implant placement uh, and the uh, nasal floor elevation. 
uh, so it is uh, valuable techniques. It's um, well described in the literature. If we have, uh, if we are well prepared, we can do any advanced uh, surgeries. So uh, this is my presentation for today. Um, I would uh, remind everybody or my colleagues that. Always teamwork is the key to for the success. So when you are having like good assistance around you, will make your life easier. When you have um, uh, when you have good equipment, you will have will make your life easier. Planning is the key, and knowledge is the key. So if we don't know something, we we'll go to back to the literature saying, and we have a lot of people describing this before us. Of course, our own uh, personal experiences would. Uh, would be um, would be very uh, valuable uh, to uh, to add to the surgeries, but also it is important to take evidence-based uh, steps toward uh, um, our surgeries and to know exactly the pros and cons for each surgery. So I hope you enjoyed the surgery this uh, presentation, and uh, uh, it is. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure to answer any question. Uh, um, this is my email address, and uh, thank you very much. I'm going to leave right now. My uh, dear friend, Dr. Ahmad Saloum, is going to be uh, next uh, in this uh, um, significant, awesome uh, presentation. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll keep in touch, and we'll see you soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum.